Hello everyone, I am Bradley Swart, Associate Professor of Computer Information Systems at the College of DuPage in Glen Ellen, Illinois, and this video is a continuing part in a long series of learning the C++ programming language. So this is basically the video right after Hello World, so we're ready to talk about you know, CIN, the interactive input, using the IO manip to be able to do formatting so that we can actually print data out how we want to on the screen, and then just the basics, just getting everything else going with assignments and data types and all of that kind of stuff. So I have Visual Studio up and running here, over here on the right-hand side. I also have my PowerPoint slides going over here. I can move myself over a little bit. There we go. And so we're ready to kind of talk about everything else. So C out is something that we know about already. So I can just, I want to go, okay, C out. Oops, I'm forgetting different languages, uh, different uh, classes. So I go C out and I go, uh, enter a value, please. Something like that. And I don't need an end line here. And then, so that is how you would print something out to the screen, right? So that's, that's just a quick little review. And you go, enter a value, please. And there's a colon. I put a little space after. I'm feeling good about this. And now I can use CN to basically get input from the user and ask, ask them to input data. And I can parse this and place it into a variable. And so, you know, so what I can do is something like you see here, CN. And I can do the same thing here. But you kind of need to have a variable up front. I could, should it be an, see, that's the thing. Should it be an integer? Should it be a float or a double? What should it be? And so, like, that one helps out a little more, right? So then now I can put int in here, and I can say int value, and then I can say c in value, and notice that the arrows go the other way. Because the, the stream, the in, like, where is the information going? In this case, the information is going out to the console. And in this case, the information is coming in, and it's going into the value from the user. So can't really do much with it just yet. So let's say enter, about, enter an integer value so you see where the cursor is. It's right there. And I hit 9 and enter. And so, yeah, then I should probably be able to prove that I put values in just since this is the first time we're ever using this. So the value you entered was, and then I can print value. And do an inline, get it all in there. There we go. And try this out now. Enter a number, 17. The value you entered was 17. So yes, the value is coming in from the user, and it's parsing it, however it's doing it, and it's converting it into the integer data type. And so one thing to say, just I'm just going to say it now. The one thing you can't do, or at least we don't know how to do until advanced C++, so it is to say, what happens if I put like a string in and, and I'm expecting a number value? It's like, well, things will go wrong, of course. And of course, what we there needs to be ways to f fix this to be like, well, you entered bad data. Can you give me, you know, can you basically, can you try again? And we could do that if we were expecting a range. And we'll see this in later chapters when it comes to uh, using while loops to basically have input validation and whatnot. But for now, no matter what, in this course, if I enter the wrong data type, things aren't going to work out. So just just for your understanding. So this works for pretty much every data type. We'll see later in this video series here that uh, string has a little bit different, is a little bit different, and that's only because you can enter a space, and space is what we usually call the delimiter. So how do we know one value from the next? We put a space in between two numbers. And so if you're talking about values, integer numbers or, or decimal numbers, yeah, that works out fine. But if I'm trying to put my name and I Bradley Sword and I put a space in front of it, how does the computer know? And that's a big deal, and we'll talk about that in a little bit here. So this is kind of, you know, it's like coming down to it here, just a different order of operations. They say, like, they do an int, then the C out, then the C in. And I guess force of habit for me over the years has been to do things this way, just the way it goes for me. And as long as you have, as long as you, as long as you set up the int before you input to it, it's going to work out just fine. And it's unfortunate, I guess, that you can't do this in one line of code. Fort maybe, it's a, maybe it is fortunate, because maybe that one line of code would just look horrendous if you could do it anyway. Okay, so th what we've done here is we've displayed a prompt. So if I, if I just commented this out, right, and you just, if you just saw a blinking cursor, what would you think is going on with your program? What, is it thinking? Is it doing? What is, it, what is going on with my program? How was, was I expected to know to put a 9 in there? And that's exactly why... You know, we put prompts and we tell the user what is expected of them. You know, we don't just, you know, go, well, 
Google is like the one exception. You go to Google and there is the box for you to put information and we, you know, you understand what that is, but you go to any other website, especially things that you would log into, it's like there's it's not just one of those things where you just click randomly in a certain place and go, "Hey, how was I supposed to know to click there to put my password in?" It's very clearly, "Hey, put password here" or "Hey, put your put your username there." And so you and so if this was Python, you could do all of this in that one line of code with the input. But this isn't Python, so we can't do much with that right now. So this is this is pretty much the most efficient way we've got in C++ to handle this situation. So again, you can do two at a time like this. I, again, I don't really recommend it. You can. Let's see. Enter. Let's see, enter a value, and then how about enter two integer values? And so I can have value, I can have, I'll just call it value 1 and value 2, and I can input value 1 and say I like multiple lines for this just so it makes it under, a little better understanding just for me, and maybe I'm just being whatever again, but, uh, but it does make it easier for me to understand. And so I can make value 1, I can make value 2. But what happens here is I can do this and I can run this and enter two integer values, please. I can put an eight and I hit an enter and then it's just sitting there. And it's like, okay, at this point I presume it's waiting for me to put a value in. And it does, it is. So eight and a nine. So I don't have to hit the enter. This is what, I'm, either you do this this way or you do it this way. I can do eight space nine. And that's what I was saying a minute ago, that space is a delimiter. It tells me that the, that the text here is done for the first token and then the second token starts up after the space and it's so eight and it's the same what you see eight then nine and that space was the delimiter and so multiple values from keyboard must be separated by spaces and the order of course is important it's reading one at a time the first value goes into value one the second into value two and so they do the same kind of stuff with the length and width and then you can do whatever you want with them you say like once you have it inside as a variable there you go. You treat it however you want. You know, just a lot. You know, said so you got. I've got my givens now, and now you said, what would I do with it? I don't know. Int uh, int a equals value one times value two, or something like that. That's what they're doing here for area. I'm just I'm just kind of just showing that once the values are input, then you can treat them like any integer values. But you have to make sure that they're not garbage. They're not uninitialized data when you do this. Okay, so coming back to now mathematical expressions. So those of you in the engineering courses, for sure, this is more of what you want. So pi, for whatever reason, again, pi is something you have to create yourself. So just go steal pi to 10 and 14 decimal places if you don't remember it. And just, if you need it, const uh, double pi equals 3.1.159.26535. One day I'll learn a couple more digits because... I still need six or seven more digits to be accountable to as a double data type. You can see there one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so maybe I need to know to 20 digits. No big deal. One of these days. But anyway, coming back. So these kind of calculations we've talked about in the previous lecture, multiplication, addition, and so forth. That's great and all, but a lot of what we do doesn't use that kind of stuff. There's a lot of trig and there's a lot of logarith you know, logarithmic stuff and, and anything that, you know, that CMath can handle. But before I get to this, just remember then your PEMDAS rules apply. There is no true exponential, remember that again, that caret or star star from Python does not apply in C++. I don't think there, there's any plans to add that. And so PEMDAS, you know, parentheses first, then no exponents, then multiplication division, modulus falls in there. Modulus is a division operation. And then addition, subtraction at the same order. So just no, no reason to talk about this. This is seventh grade math, right? So just, and if you need to change the way the numbers come out, then of course that's where the parentheses come in so that you get the result that you're expecting from the values that you have. But if you can help it, get rid of all of this and just replace it with 28, unless it makes sense, unless there's a reason why you do this kind of stuff to add all this together, because why would you waste, you know, why not just put a 28? The, the compiler will reduce it down to 28 anyway, but if it makes it more readable, at the end of the day, reduce it down. And you say, like with video game stuff, when I'm playing with offsets and I'm moving things around the screen, I'll kind of hack it up to get it where it needs to go, and then I'll go back and figure out the numbers. I don't have to, but it's, it simplifies the amount of code. Okay, so it's here, pow function. And all these other functions are found in CMath. And C 
means C and math means math. So there's math functions that the C programming language have supplied in this library. So let's see, let me take a look. I'll open up cppreference.com and take a look. The C math header has a ton of stuff already for us. I mean, like, am, am I going to want to figure out how a cosine function is implemented under the hood? I think it's an interesting exercise, but outside of that, I'd rather leave the experts to do the best implementation of that. So you have absolute value, uh, floating point modulus functions, max and min functions, exponentials, logs, power, here's power, square root, cube root, mm -hmm. hypotenuse, hypot, sine, cosine, tangent, arc sine, arc cosine, two arc tangent, all the hyperbolics, these error terms I don't know much about, ceiling, floor, truncations, rounds, different types of rounds, I suppose. They say we're kind of going off into the parts where I've never truly used anymore. Is infinite? Is this? Is that? But you can see there's a ton. And this, oh, goodness, look at all this stuff. This, this just came around in the 2017 edition. Oh, my goodness. What is all? Complete elliptical integral of the third kind. I'll take your word. You need these guys. So, um, uh, like where polynomials. Like, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. All these cool things that I've never heard of. But anyway, coming back. So... That documentation for C++ can be tricky. It's not written. Like Python is written at a more approachable level. C++ documentation can be very daunting sometimes. So just be careful when you go out there reading and try to find a few sources to help you find find that place that uh, explains it in a way you understand a little better. So coming back here, power function, we just have to get used to just, you know, like, I know I can use power. So if I wanted to, I, I, said, I cannot do this. You might think you can, like, oh, that's power, or you think, oh, I can do this. And so, like, this this one won't work for us, but if I try this, it's not going to turn out like you think. So let's see. Let's just, let's, just, uh, uh, let's just try it out, just prove it to you one time, so maybe by seeing this, you won't do it. The result is, and then print out A. So let's see, what about 2 to the 8th power, 256? How about that? 2 to the 8th power comes out as 10. <laughs> that is absolutely not true. So just, you know, what if I try 3 cubed? 3 to the 27, right? 3 times 3 times 3 comes out as 0. And you know, I don't even want to explain that is an X, that is a different operation that you're, an XOR operation that you're trying. And it only works for integers. I wouldn't be able to do this if, 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 if this was a float anyway, because it can only be done on integer values. So just understand that that is not a way to go about doing it. I have to use CMath, and I have to use a the power function to make it work. And so now, as I would expect, 3 to the 3rd power comes out as 27, and 2 to the 8th power comes out as 256. So, and you just have to understand what, you know, like you guys do too. You know which functions to use, and you know how many parameters to supply. And so that's how things work out. And so slopes, you guys know to put parentheses around things, PEMDAS rules, and all of that stuff. So there's no reason to kind of go crazy on that type of explanation. All right, so our first hurdle when it comes to just using data types and just getting used to just mathematical operations is this apples and oranges type conversion kind of thing. And so if we, if we treat everything correct and we treat doubles and treat ints and we only work with the same data types, we're not going to really see too many issues. But a lot of times, like in this case, if I wanted to you know, put two, two values together and calculate an average, like so if I do like, you know, so A equals this divided by 2. So if I just, you know, just averaging the two values together, and you go, well, what would happen now if I put in, you know, an 8 and a 9? And they go, well, the average comes out as 8. And so that's not correct, right? The average should be 8.5. But I don't want to, you know, but I want to keep these as integer values. I shouldn't have to change my data types to accommodate my output, right? I mean, I guess that's a, I think that's a valid concern is that I shouldn't have to basically invalidate and, and, and have to tinker with a lot of different aspects of formatting just you know, and ruin a lot of my code just to get myself there. So, but what will happen here, like you're saying, like it'll convert, and this is integer math, int plus int is int, int divided by int, and even if I put a, a dot zero in here, so even if I do that five and six gets me five, because at the end of the day, this, like we were discussing last time, this is still... This is not integer division anymore because I set aside and said, oh, one of you is two. However, what happens here is, oops, I guess that's a warning. 
arithmetic overflow using plus on a four byte value and casting to an eight byte value. Interesting, right? So that it's kind of warning you to these kind of things. Exactly what this is showing you over here on this side is that there can be a problem with this because it's doing conversions. It's converting the int into some data type, or and then it's taking divided by 2.0. And at the end of the day, even though you might get an, a, a floating point result, the var the variable here is also is already an int. And so maybe this should be a double. You see, there's a lot of little things going on here. So, and there's still a warning there with that. And that's because it's int divided by double, which isn't always the best idea. So five and six. Well, I get you know I get myself to my 5.5 like I was expecting. But again, this still isn't best practices. You, you generally want to make sure that you explicitly convert all these variables to the different types. And it's like it's, we just showed it like as a very simple example, but between floats and doubles and all sorts of things, the calculations can get thrown off a bit. And depending on how much you care about that, that's a big deal. Like for simulations and you know engineering topics, yes, that's a big deal. For me in a video game, if it's off by you know something to the sixth or seventh decimal point, no one's ever going to truly notice that that pixel is you know maybe one half a pixel off or something like that. Okay, so let's not worry about that. So there's this idea of type coercion, and so you know so what will happen if I set up and I say okay I have a short short b equals two, and then I have an int and I say int c equals b, and short is a 16-bit two-byte quantity, int is a four-byte quantity. And so this is called a promotion, where we're taking the two that is stored as a short, and we'll, we're making it, putting it into a bigger space that is set aside for an int. And the, same, the compiler will do this just perfectly for us. And so we can, we hit this breakup. I got to put energy values in here. Here we go. So you can say b is two, c is two, but now it's a different. Right? It's, it's weird, right? It's the same value, but it's a different data type. So it's a short two versus an int two. And so, and it converted this two, which was a short, into the int two, which is a longer one. So if promotion is making yourself, putting yourself into a bigger space, you could imagine then demotion is putting yourself into a smaller space. And so that is kind of a problem when it comes down to it, because what if I have int, like, let's just kind of break this up and shake this around a minute, and say int a equals 400, and then I say short, um, let's, let's use character this time, character b equals a. And so A is 400, which is perfectly allowed under a 4-byte data type. But if I move down to a 1-byte data type, what am I going to get out of this? <coughs> Excuse me. And is it running? Do I, have an error? Do I have an actual error out of this? One second here. Let me see. Oh, I am famous for redefining variables. Same names all the time. Okay, so let me just get to, get to the point here. So I say A, A is 400, like I'm expecting. But now the demotion of that... And so the compiler didn't actually complain, right? It complained about this. It's, it's actually, it's a weird error because it's not, it's not coming up here, but it's coming up in here that it's a warning. But there's no warning telling me that this is bad news and now my B value is negative 112. Would you, would you expect that? Like if, what would you expect that value to truly be? So you have to understand that you know, C++ will silently do these things for you. Other languages won't. The more modern languages, Java, C Sharp, they will put up an error and say, you will have to basically tell me that you are okay with this being, you know, maybe your value maybe being uh, mangled later on. So that's what's going on. It's, they're called coercion rules. C++ has rules for how to convert these things from data type to data type. And again, as you see, oopsie, you might not get the results you're expecting to see. Um, so overflow, that was basically overflow and underflow is what we're discussing here because, you know, 400 can fit as an int, but when I smash it down, I'm losing some, I'm losing some ones that are bits that are not in the eight bits that I can store because there's more than eight bits of value stored there. But coming back, that doesn't mean every value is ruined, just ones that are outside of, the, that will end up outside of the range. So coming back here for this five value, as we did, I think we did it for two a minute ago here, said so going back, it's five for AA, but it's also five for the B, because five can fit in that. I, when I hack everything down, all I'm losing are zeros, and if I lose nothing but zeros, I'm not losing anything at all. And so just say, say some systems will, there. obviously we learn no warning messages for us here. 
And so that, you know, so it, it sometimes can be difficult to work with data types, especially starting out, or a lot of times when you're trying to just write, you don't know exactly what you're trying to solve. So a lot of times int, bool, let's say, we, you know, int, bool, float, double, those are the data types we generally use. We generally don't go out of our way to try to just use custom like shorts and characters, you know, unless we really need to limit our space. Okay, so coming back here to this, we don't have, all I have access, I can't even do a loop or anything yet, like that yet here, but I can say if I wanted to, if I, you know, I can convert a data type into another data type, but just on a temporary basis. So like when I set up int AA, that is hard coding into my program that there's going to be a variable called AA and it's going to be an int data type. There's going to be a double called pi and so forth, and double called A and so forth and so on. But when I need to do something temporarily, like if I do int, uh, I'll, just, I'll do const int number of values, and I say it's int for on purpose here because it's because I want it to be an int, right? Because I because it's a the number of values entered does not need to be a fractional thing. You can't have a, you know, I can't, how many numbers did you enter? Ah, two and a half. It doesn't work, right? It's going to be a whole number quantity. But coming back to our discussion a minute ago, that if I put two values in, you get, you get the wrong result because it's integer math. So, and again, I shouldn't have to change my data types into float or double just to account, accommodate for one division operation. Because at the end of the day, if I start doing that, then I'm, I can introduce error into my into my code. Because I can't ex I can't express every value as a float than I can as an int. And so I'm you know depending on the numbers that are input, especially on the high end, you're going to get an error term, and you don't want error term because there's no reason for it. So what I can do here is just during the calculation, and that's where this idea of static cast comes. And let me just move this over for just a brief moment here, so I can say static cast. And then that's an angle bracket. Put parentheses around this. And what this means is on a temporary, you're basically saying, hey, compiler, on a temporary basis, just for this one division, could you take the number of values, which I know is an integer value, and so however the, the bit string is represented in binary, could you convert that into the equivalent bit string in as a double value? And it will do that, and then, since now this is a double value, I will get the result I was expecting. I'll get that 5.5 out of it. 5 and 6 now comes back as 5.5 because it converted that into a double. One of those two, one of these two things has to be a double. And again, I usually use the denominator. Some other people use the numerator. It only, it, it only has to be one of the two for this to work out. But maybe in our case, see, that's the thing. What if I, because this thing is still screaming at me. What if I... Whoops, I don't know what just happened. I do not know what happened. I'm hitting the wrong buttons here. Will this work? It will just not go it just will not go away, huh? So I guess at this point cast the value int one, int two. Anyway, so I thought I could thought I could get away with it by moving this over. But as long as one of the two values is transferred and, and, and basically coerced or cast into a double, your result will be exactly what you expect. And you can do this for any data type. And so you can turn any, like an into, you know, it's like, this is one way of converting. There's the old C way. If you know Java, you just put the type in parentheses. But the C++ way of doing things is to do it this way because you want to explicitly tell the world, hey, I'm casting this into a different type. Help me you out. Know, and it's supposed, to be, it's supposed to be ugly on purpose, so you try never to do it. Or you do it as little as possible, as opposed to trying to slip it under the rug. Because, again, with experience, over time, if you try to slip it under the rug, you're going to confuse even yourself, and you're going to have a bug that you're going to have to fix, and it's going to take a while to figure out what's going on. So that's what typecasting is all about. And so again, here is the C style, here's the Java style, and again, nope, that's, you know, it's preferred, it's required, it's basically think of it as required. So I'm teaching you C++ programming, so program using the C++ constructs, static int, I'm sorry, static cast, not just the int in parentheses. Alrighty, so say so you can do things like this, you shouldn't do things like this, because it just gets, it does get confusing as to what's happening. But if you did do something like this, some things work left to right, but this works right to left. And so you can see that 5 would go in and set equal to Z, and then the, 
z would get set to y, which is 5, then, then y would get set to x, which is 5. And again, it gets confusing, especially, you know, you put a lot of these things together. How often does this, does this happen anyway? Not very often. So it's just, it's whatever you want it to be. So, so it's always right to left. It's not left to right. It's not PEMDAS rules when it comes to equalities like this. It goes right to left when it comes to how it resolves this line of code. And you can see it's basically equivalent to what you see with the parentheses as you can. It's like the, these are the implied parentheses for this operation. Okay, so say for adding things together, we usually, you know, sum equals sum plus one. So, you know, adds one to the variable sum, and you could do that. So you can do x equals x plus, x equals x minus. I mean, this is very, you know, very obvious that I can take a variable and add, subtract, multiply, divide, and take a modulus and put a value back exactly where it came from. But the thing is here that you can see I can use this, this little fancy operator so I don't have to type the name in twice. And so if I wanted to, I could just use b plus equals 2. So there's two ways, how many different ways to do this? b equals b plus 2, b plus equals 2. Those are two ways to do that. And so interestingly enough, let me move myself over on the other side here. There we go. And what you can do then also is for 1, if I'm going to increment by 1, there's actually four ways to do this. Isn't that, isn't that weird, right? So you could do things this way. And to make the joke, if I use C instead of B, this is, a, and I just say care C instead, you can see where the name C++ came from. Because C equals C plus 1 is equivalent to C plus equals 1, which is equivalent to plus plus C, which is a pre-increment. We'll discuss that in a, either this slide set or a future time, we will. Or C plus plus, which is incremental. It's an increment of C, and that's what C plus plus is, according to Bjarn Struskrik, the inventor of the C plus plus language. Okay, so you can do plus equals, minus equals, mu multiply equals, this, whatever, but this only applies for plus, plus, and minus, minus. Because what would, what would divide, divide mean, right? So divide, divide, C, what does that mean? <laughs> that mean? Divide, divide, C is a comment. Hey, what do you know about that, right? So obviously it only works for plus, plus, and minus, minus. So formatting, imp or formatting the output is very important, right? So... Uh, you know, like in this case, what if, if if I'm doing this kind of, you know, oh God, this is a green thing. if I'm doing this over and over and over again, say five, six, what if this was, I don't know, like money, five and six, and I want to print this out with, to two decimal points? What if I want to put a dollar sign in front of it and things like that? And so there are ways to format the output to handle that and just, you know, it's, I, I'm not going to you know, say like I'm going to use this a few times in the courses I teach. And, but I feel like, like anything else, formatting is important, but how often do you really care in the modern world about formatting text onto a console? That would be done pretty much in some kind of graphic window, or that would be done in a browser or something like that. So, but just to say that we do need to discuss this, we should at least know the basics of how to get started with this. So I can control the size, position, number of digits, so forth and so on. I do need to include another include file called pyomanip, I think we're up to four already for you know, input-output manipulation, of course. And so you can use different ones here. I can use one called set with, and what you do is you just put it right before the one, you know, so if I'm gonna say set this, set with 20. This is just to prove a point here. Then you go enter two values, please. And you go, okay, there we go. The result is, and then with 20 spaces right justified, it'll, it'll fill in those 20 spaces with the value that it's supposed to fill in, which is 5.5 in this case. And that's what set width does. Set w, sorry. And so there's others. You can say set width, set width, set width. Oh my goodness, right? Like all that to format this. Can't you just do it in one string? Whatever. I mean, just, just to prove a point here. Just, oh my goodness, look how ugly this is. And just to go, okay, so what else is there? I can apply fixed. What does that do? Let's take a look. Here, let me just, just real quick here, let me get rid of these input values. Just so, and just use five and six here. Five, so we can just, so I can just run this without having to type in the input every single time. Okay, so there, my set width is still 20, but now when I use fixed, by default, I think I get six decimal points by default. So even if it was a whole number, even if it's a whole number, it will still print out to six decimal points. 
And so that's one way of doing things. You can use show point to always print for floating, always print the decimal value. There's a lot of these kind of compete with one another. And I'm not 100% sure, you know, like I kind of sometimes I have to just kind of tinker a little bit for a minute or two, not that long, a couple seconds just to get the format in the way I want to. And so set precision is the one, the other major one then, because this is the one where I could say, I want this thing to be two, uh, I want this thing to be two decimal points after the dot. So let's see, uh, decimal positions here. Uh, so set precision two. And what comes out of this then is there we go, 5.00, or if I come back here, fix this up, 5.50, of course. And so there you go, 5.50, right justified, 20 spaces. So I've used how many things together here. Fix, set width, set precision. And I only put this on two lines so it's not spilling over over into land. You can't see. And there's a ton of others, but those there's a ton, there are a ton of, you know, of other ways to go about doing this. But these are the important ones because you're going to want to set the width. You're going to want to set the precision on the decimal. You're going to want to always show a decimal. Because even on your receipts, right, even if it came to, you know, the number comes out to $20 even, you don't just print 20, you print 20.00, you know, those kind of things, right? So, so what are they doing here? See, I see, and what do they have? They have set precision and set width. And so some of these are good for, like, once you set it, they're good forever. So, like, what will happen if I do A, then A again? I'm, cu I'm, I'm curious. Will it, do, will it use the set width of 20 twice, or will it not? And see, that's the thing. Set width is only good for the next print. And so 20 spaces were for that. But once that completed, it went right after. And it didn't fill it in with another 20 spaces. It just filled it in with 5.5. So you have to put the set width every single time if you want it to, to work. But fixed fixed works one time. And, you, and then until you change it, put it back to normal, then you can leave it alone. So, you, so again, this is just experimentation with this. So what else is there? Left justified, right justified, set precision, show point, fixed, set width. Those are the big, you know, the big six. There are quite a few others that you can work with if you needed to. So that's all I need to discuss in that here. Okay, so moving on now to working with characters and string objects here. So strings are treated differently than the other data types. And again, when I was describing it earlier, it's because usually how do we know one number from another? There's at least a space between them. And we don't get that because I could put Bradley space forward as my name and the computer, the compiler would see that space and go, oh, that's you know, Bradley, but not anything after that space. And so we need another mechanism to allow us to hit that delimiter. And so the delimiters, you can use CN so I can set up a string. Uh, I can try anyway. Let me just you know, say name, string name, C out, enter name. And then I can say C into name. And then I can do one more C out and say you entered. And then you can say name and then end line. Okay, try it out. So I go, okay, yeah, if you put Brad, you go, oh, that works fine. You go, you worry wart. And then if I try this one more time, though, and I go, oh, it's fine, Brad Ford. And you go, there it goes. It said you entered Brad. And everything that comes after that space was never was never was never brought in because we never well, there was no code to do that. So the space is that delimiting character, and so we need this get line function to do the work for us to ignore that space tab, any of the the normal line breaks or spaces, you know, those kind of white space characters. And then the end line, the enter key, is what will will dictate the end of the of the the string to parse. And so what you can see here is you just have, it's a little different, of course, give, give, give me that much here, get line, and then I have to supply C in, and then I supply name. And so we said, we haven't discussed references, we haven't discussed streams so much, but this looks really weird compared to the way we did things a minute ago, C in, arrow, arrow, name, but this get line function takes two parameters, it takes a stream, and which is C in, which is, you know, an input stream, and then it takes in the name of the variable that is going to be basically when I input what is it, you know, the variable it's going to be parsed into. And it should be a reference. I don't know why it comes in. Blah, blah, blah. Look at all that really complicated stuff. Yep, reference, reference. So reference, reference means this is going to be modified by the function. And then I can, that's why I can print it out when after the function completes because this function modifies that inside of here. And so just, just understand, if you care about spaces for strings, you got to use getLine. And if you don't care, 
you can use just uh, you can just use the plain old CN like we like you've used before. So just the difference there. And so I said characters get a little iffy and say I don't like to go into these little details. Some students like to set up all this stuff and then I can still break break the code. See, you know, the input output on this and C++, I guess for those who know exactly how every little detail works, can can be pretty good for you, but I forget how, but I know I can go ahead and I know I can infinite loop my program just by entering data exactly incorrect, even though for something simple like enter an integer value, I forget how it works, but I can infinite loop. I never remember how. So it's like things can get a little weird uh, the way input is, so just understand we're just going to keep to the happy day happy world thing here where when I ask for a value, you might put it in the wrong range, but at least you'll always give me the correct data type. So that's, you know, so that kind of, all this ignore stuff and things like that. Okay, so again, remember, string is, is a different blue because it's part of the C++ standard template library. It is not part of the core language that a C style string would be. And so that means, let's see, what happens if I go here and I go, go to definition, does it show me? Oh my God, look at all that. I, I, I've been doing this for years. I, there's only a couple people on earth who can read this and go, what am I looking at? But you can see there's a lot going on here. But what is a string? But it's an array of characters. It just, there's a, you see character here. And it, it basically under the hood, it's just keeping track of characters for us. So I'm just sorry for that. We'll just kind of come back. And again, there's a lot of stuff going for it. And we could then, I guess I could look into it right now for you. So string to us is called basic string under the hood. And so here's CPP reference for that. So here's your string. There's a lot of different string types. But the, the things that matter here, you can set equality. You can get specific characters out of the string, like an array notation, which we'll talk about later if, you're not under, if you don't understand them. You've never worked with arrays, but you have if you've worked with Excel before. And all of these functions and all, like, like all these things that we don't cover till advanced C++, like, like iterators and things like that, capacities and like sizes and lengths, so like that, that we would cover here. Clear and insert and push back and pop back. And if you want to, of course, you can just look up you know, just look up string, you know, anywhere in Google and just basically click on the first or second link and you will see there's a lot going on. It's one of the biggest types of objects because a string can be anything. It could be a number inside of there. It could be just a string of character data. It could be a binary file. So we need, you know, basically we need to take this and parse it many, many different ways, not just the more obvious ones of integers and floats and whatnot. So because of that, this is why there's so much going on that you can do with these kind of things because who the heck knows I send data over the internet that has to get you know has to get parsed on the other end so concatenating strings getting their length that's things you can do with a string that you can't just ease more easily do it's more easy to do this in C++ than it is to do in C when you're using a character array or a const care pointer to things so I, I can use plus equals I can use plus I can basically use the relational operators to see which uh, to see which word is less than or greater than the other, as if I was putting it into a dictionary, which word would go first, and those kind of things. So sorting is a big deal. So again, a lot of things are done for us. The you know, libraries are great at uh, coming up with stuff that we do on a normal basis, making it fast, efficient, and making it robust, and making it bug-free over the years, so that I don't have to worry about all those little details. So we like said we we went through this earlier when it came to the mathematical functions. We showed all of them through C++ 11, C++ 17, which that was the first time I noticed there was a ton of stuff there that is now new part of CMath. And so you just have to understand there's different data, you know, the different data types. Sign can take floats, sign can take doubles. So let's see if I just go in here and say sign, and say there's four different versions of this. You can see here in the IntelliSense: double in, double out. Float in, float out, long double in, long double out, and don't worry about that one. <laughs> but you can see the big three, right? So the three different floating point data types, float, double, and long double, each of them have a function that can be used because ultimately under the hood, with the different sized elements, you know, four bytes versus eight bytes versus possibly ten bytes, the math, the math under the hood might be different. So there's different functions to do the job. So you just have to you know, realize what you're working with. And again, you just like sign of, you know, and, the, and everything in a computer, remember, as you should know if you've been using calculators for quite a while here, everything is done in radians in C++ and pretty much every computer programming language. There are some functions that can 
do the math for us and convert to degrees, but I don't think C++ is one of those. I can't, let's see, nope, D sign does not exist for degree sign or something like that. I've used that in other languages before, in other IDEs and things like that, other libraries before. And so, oh, random number generation. Yeah, let's talk about that. So, pseudo random number generation. So, what I can do here is, okay, it's like random, the random number is. Okay, and I can say value. So, you know, random numbers are a big deal. Playing a video game would be really, well, how, how, how exciting would it be? Watching you speedrunners out there. How exciting would you be if you knew exactly what was going to happen every moment, every time you did whatever you did, right? So, maybe it would be exciting for you. I don't have time to speedrun things. I used to do that before it was cool. I was a hipster like that. And so, I can go see in. I'm just, I'm not going to worry about the... Uh, oh, no, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to say, I'm just going to pick a random number. And so I can say rand. Rand is a function that will generate a random number for me. Let's see what it prints out. And so it prints out 41. And if I run this again, it can print it out. What do you think it will print out if I run this a second time? Uh, my bet's on 41. There we go. Why would my bet be on 41? Anybody want to bet now? It's going to be 41. That, I'm literally running it over and over and over again. And so the random number generator is running off, if you guys know about pseudo-random numbers, it's running off a, the same seed every single time. So a random number generator is basically giving me a function that will give me different values, but it's a function. So like basically from every input, I can, I can figure out the next output. And if I'm starting from the same seed value every single time, I'm going to get the same string of random numbers. And so one thing first off is if I wanted to here, like, how do I determine, how would I get a number from, like, 0 or 1 to 6? Because if I did something like this, rand mod 6, the mod operation would give me something between 0 and 5. Because this thing is just going to spit off random numbers, and when I mod 6, it's going to give me 0 to 5. So if I wanted, like, a, you know, 1d6 from any board game or anything like that, I would have to do something like this, where I say, okay, randomize between 0 and 6, then add 1, and that'll get me from 0 to 5 to 1 to 6. So you'll have to watch out a few times, you know, out in the world, you'll have to randomly generate some values, and you just got to make sure. So what, So 41 was the answer. This should be, what, uh, 2? Oh, number 6. I just, uh, maybe I just thought, I was, I'm modding by the wrong value or something like that. So the random number is 6, because 41 mod 6 is, yeah, I guess it's 5, right? So yeah, 36, 41, plus 1 is 6. And again, I'll get that every single time. And you can see here there's this thing called SRAM that I can use. And can I do it this way? Yes, I can. Let's see. Let me just rebuild this. Oop. All right. You will get a warning. And I don't want to get into how you can fix it. It just use a static cast and whatever to fix this. But SRAM time null pointer. Now I won't win every bet. Now, the, now all bets are off. So now every time I play this, I'll get a four. And you could do this, I can't, I guess I could do this a few times since I don't have loops working for me just yet. So just to spit out four different numbers, just to go, okay, so it's five, six, three, two. And if I run this again, I, oh, wow, that's a good one. I get five, 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 five. And I got four, one, six, one. Oh, man, what are the odds? It was almost like Yahtzee, right? So coming back, so this S Rand is great, and you should. The only time you should ever use it is the first line of code in main. I know students will put it into a tight loop. It's so like I, I on exam days when I used to be able to give exams in a classroom. I hated the days where the student put the SRAND inside of a loop, and they're wondering why why it wouldn't sort or whatever. And it's like all you have to do is move that line of code. Everything else is perfect, but I couldn't tell them because it's an exam. The SRAND only goes one time because you just need to get, you know, just it's based off the timer on your computer, and it, that's the only thing you need to go off of. It's just go, okay, right now, give me a different seed so I can have a different number, a random number generation. And so that covers that. What, run it one more time. Two, three, four, two. All right, so you can see every time now, and all it is is this. This will bring me right back to where I was with six, six, five, five, and six, six, five, five, and so forth and so on. Okay, so I'm not going to worry about hand tracing the program because, and you can, and so like a lot of times, like just pretend like you like a computer program is running on a piece of paper, and you're just running basically being the computer and just going through line for line and trying to fix things up. You could go ahead and do that. 
So, you know, so just put your finger on a line of code, run through it, move your finger and carry on and just write the numbers on a piece of paper or an Excel spreadsheet or something you could, you know, and hand trace your way through it. And of course, it is useful to locate logical or mathematical errors that basically the only thing C++ can do for us is find uh, uh, syntax errors, right? For the most part, as long as it compiles and it gets to the run stage, that's a runtime error. The computer has no idea what logic you're actually trying to perform. It just knows it just knows what it's programmed to do. So like in this case, what is wrong with this program? And so you like if you wrote this out after every line of code, what are the values of my variables? And so if you just I'll spare you the effort here, and it just comes down to the fact that when I went to try to average the things together, I the division came first for PEMDAS, so num3 divided by 3 is gonna give me it's going to give me a different value than num1 plus num2 plus num3 divided by 3. So I would have to, you know, at that point I would go, oh, there are parentheses that can help me, that can solve this problem for me, because the result will come out wrong otherwise. And so coming down to it, how can I do this? So as a hand tracing, definitely, if it was ever a thing in the past, it's a thing in the past. What I can do is I can use a series of breakpoints in my program. And so yeah, this is one of those things you write down, get good at this, because for any programmer, it's one thing we you know, teach you something a lot of people don't teach, is you know, like, especially when you have an error, how the heck would you go back and find the line of code where things broke? And that is a huge skill to have, because if you can find that error in a minute versus find that in a day, you could see how, <laughs> how much better off you are as a programmer. And so what you can do is you can, and you've probably seen me do this already, is you can, inside this gray area over here, you can click and set up what's called a breakpoint. And so what that is, is the program will run, and when it hits that breakpoint, it basically pauses. It hasn't run the line of code it's at yet, but then you can go ahead and check out different aspects of your program. So let me see, let me just add a few things. Let me just put, just real quick int x4, int y6, whatever, int z equals x plus y, something like that. And what I can do here is I can hit a breakpoint. I'll put the breakpoint in, you can see what's going on. And so right now the program ran to the breakpoint. You can see it's paused because the little yellow arrow is there. And you can see that it randomized and gave me four values. And so from there I go, okay, the program is paused. There's nothing I can do inside the actual program. I have to work through Visual Studio to see what's going on. And so the first thing you'll notice here with this thing paused is you can start mousing over values and you can see what's going on. And so like I can mouse over the word value here and it'll give me the value six. That is what the current value of value is. It's a six. SRAN time, all, you can say if you want to get into craziness, you can start looking at all this extra stuff. But if I go to X here, X is garbage because the, that line of code has not been executed yet. So X has not been set to four yet. And so how do I move forward in my program? So I move forward so by hitting F10. And those of you on laptops, you probably have to use function F10. But you go F10, and then you'll see the arrow go to the next line. And now when I mouse over X, you'll see X has been set to 4. And that's because it, it did the line of code it's supposed to. And now Y is garbage because Y hasn't been set. And if I hit F10 again, now you can see that Y has been set and Z hasn't been yet, but X and Y are. So by F10 one more time, now I'm done and Z is 10. So that is step line for line for line. And when we get to the next chapter, I'll show you the new one. I'll show you F11 to step into a function. And so you generally can't step into anything that is just part of, like I can't step into time. I can't step into SRAN because there's no debugging information. These are already pre-compiled part of the C, you know, C++ library. Basically, you can only debug your way into your own code. So just be careful. But so it's like you'd be very hesitant to think that uh, the, it's someone else's problem. It's 99.999% of the time you wrote the bad code. Only once in my life did I actually have an error with the compiler itself. And that was because it was an old compiler that wasn't updated. And there was just a tiny little problem that took me a day to solve. And so that's what, that's what you're going for here. Setting up breakpoints and mousing things over. You can actually right click on a variable and say uh, add watch. And you can actually set up watches down here as well in the, in the watch list. So X is 4. And so as the program is running, you can, you can see it. And so you can see X is garbage. Run, 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 run.
Run, what is happening? Why is this? There we go. Run, 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 garbage, 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 still garbage, and now it's four. So if you don't want to mouse over everything every chance you get, you can start setting watches. And again, it's just right click and, I know there's a lot of stuff here, and add watch. And you can go ahead and it'll show you at this current moment in time, what are the values of my variables that are, that are sitting around. And so if you see something that isn't right, then you can start, you can't really work your way back. You'll have to start the program over and put a breakpoint a little further up or something like that. To, you know, it takes a little time to find the true breakage. I don't have any breakage here. I can't go back to nothing to show you to go back something like this to go, oh, that's where things are wrong. But if you go to the next line of code and all your variables aren't what you expect them to be, like a hand trace, then you know, that you pretty much know the line of code that ruined you. The last item for this video today is a case study. And so like with this case, <laughs> this case, general crates, cases, they sell cases, crates, boxes, you name it. They build custom designed wooden crates. So I have been asked to write a program that does simple, simple math, but that's okay, right? So it's like, I'm getting paid, why do I care, right? So I've been asked to write a program that can calculate the volume in cubic feet, the cost, the customer price, and the profit for, for trying to sell a specific box or crate. So that's, so there's going to be a little bit of going on here. And I'm not going to write the code for it because you'll be able to see the code here. And you can just type it in if you so choose. So let me just, maybe I'll just make this a little bigger for the rest of this and move my, move myself out of the way here. Okay, so, so what you see is all the different variables and all the constants that we're going to need for this. And some of these there's no way to know outside of talking to your boss or talking to the, your customers to figure out what these kind of values are. So I'm going to, so remember constants are generally all uppercase, all caps with underscores. Constants scream out that they're constants so that you know what you're dealing with as opposed to just regular variables. So it costs, for whatever reason, it costs 23 cents per cubic foot to create a crate. And that's kind of weird considering, I don't know, just, they'll just go with it. And that's what they tell me. And then the charge, we charge 50 cents per cubic foot. So we have a, you know, 100 and something percent markup. I forget how, you know, I don't, I don't think you just divide 0.5 into, you know, 0.23 into 0.5. I think you, no, whatever. It doesn't matter. But it's a, it's a pretty high markup. You're making more than 100% off that, a little 110% or so. But those are constants. And so now what do I need? I need the three dimensions of a crate from the user. I need the length, the width, and the height, or the depth or whatever. Just name it however you want. And from those values, I can generate the volume. And so just, it's just length times width times height, right? And then from the volume, I just multiply it by 0.23 to get the cost. I multiply the volume by 0.5 to get the charge. Subtract one from the other to get the profit. Pretty simple stuff. And so coming down to it now, now thinking of it from a design standpoint, like input processing output. That's always kind of how, especially starting out here till things get more complicated chapter four or five kind of stuff, that's where things get a little more muddied. But for right now, muddled. So right now, step one is ask the user to enter the dimensions of the crate. So these two things are already givens. I need the user to give me these three. From that, I can generate everything else. So these are the inputs, this is the process, and then the output is just showing me the results of everything that I have going for me. So ask the user for the three dimensions, Calculate all those four pieces of data that I need, and then display the four pieces of data that I need. And so, if this was like a you know like a top-down chart, or if this was like a you know like note card kind of situation, user stories, all kind of thing, like this is the the, the high note card here is the you know this is the whole program, and so now this is this is the input stage, this is the process stage, this is the display stage, the output stage, and so this one this one note card became three. And then even with this, this, this one became three more. Get length, get width, get height. I'm not saying every program you write, you go to this level. You know, raise your hand if you, when you write a paper, you actually write an outline. Um, yeah, I know, that's why I get B's in all my papers, and that's why I'm a computer scientist. I get that. But, you, but I'm saying, you, but as long as you're, you're doing this so that you have a better understanding of how to solve the problem. That's all we're trying to get across here. So get the crate. I need the three dimensions. The calculate stage is basically four steps, and then the output stage is four steps. 
So there's 10 things going on in my program, right? And so, you know, add, you know get input, 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 calc, 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 display, 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 display. And so, you know, so at that point, it should be pretty, if you understand C++ or, you know, should, or even if you don't, you should be able to pick up on the repetition of everything and get things going pretty quickly once you've got the first or second ones done. And so you say volume equals length times width times height, cost equals volume times 0.23, charge is 0.5 times volume, profit equals charge minus cost. So here is their version of the program. Mine would be just would be similar, but just a little different with my best practices involved. Double length, colon, semicolon, double width, semicolon, so forth and so on. But notice that even so, they, it was nice of them to break it up onto separate lines so that there's a comment that shows you everything that's going on. And again, it, granted, this is a very simple explanation, a very simple example. But for more complicated things out in the real world, a lot of times you do. Even though it's pretty obvious, you put a comment in there so that uh, it can jag your memory of what's going on. So here are my two constants. Here are all the variables I need for everything else. Here is the input stage where I'm like, okay, here's get the length, get the width, get the height. So C out, C in, C out, C in, C out, C in. Okay, that's the whole input stage. So this combined with the givens completes the input stage because I have everything I need now to do the rest of the work. And so the calculation stage a lot of times is pretty easy. It's just exactly what we were discussing earlier. Set up the volume, cost, charge, and profit using those formulas. And then at the end of the day now, put some nice formatting in. I, did, I guess they don't have too nice formatting, but that's okay. They didn't learn their lesson with set widths and fixed and set precisions and all those kind of deals. You could do that if you so choose, but there you go. You display the volume and you display the cost and the charge and the profit. And so here is some input and some output from this. Enter dimensions in feet, 10 by 8 by 4 crate, 320 cubic foot. We will charge 160 bucks. It'll cost us $73 to make. We'll make an $86 profit, and you can see the same details here for part two. And that pretty much covers chapter three in a nutshell. You know, a lot of little things going on, just getting used to, again, the IO Street library, the, C, the CMath library, IO Manip, a lot of little things going on. But now you can kind of do a lot of programs. You can do everything but branch your programs with loops and if statements. And so that is this that is basically what's going to go on uh, the next well actually the next video will cover functions. So basically taking all of the stuff we're doing and moving them over into self-contained little modules, so kind of like the absolute value function or the cosine function, so that we write the code one time and we can use it forever more. That is the focus of the next chapter or depending on your depending on your class. Some some classes I use chapter six next and some I use chapter four next. So for those of you who are going into if statements, we go into if statements. Those of you who are going into functions, we go into functions. But again, we're, we're going to make things more complicated. We need our code to go down different branches and to start repeating itself so we don't have to write the code over and over and over again. So as always, swordb at cod.edu is my uh, email address at the college. Or you can send a comment down below here on YouTube. I'll get back to you as soon as I can see it. And uh, thanks for sticking out with me again, and uh, we'll see you next time.